welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Eli Safrai, coming on for the second time. Eli is a physicist and an engineer and a project manager uh, who's new to Pittsburgh from Israel. Eli, welcome to the podcast. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Thanks it's for coming. Always a pleasure to, to meet you. Always a pleasure to meet you, too. Yeah, I, um, I was curious to kind of learn more about what you've been up to since you moved to Pittsburgh, since I kind of interviewed you right when you first came here. Yeah, so I so think we're going nice because like, I, uh, I continue part position in, in consulting uh, remotely, uh, mainly on project management, uh, adhesives, um, manufacturing, uh, and this kind of stuff. And I've been, it, it took time to settle all the kids. I have five of them. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's wild. I have zero. Uh, <laughs> so so I, the schools are very different and to, to everything is organized now. And I also found uh, I doing, been looking around to see what's going on in the robotic uh, um, institute and the CMU. And it's amazing to see such, such a technology. I'm glad to hear you say that. I spent a lot of time at the Robotics Institute at CMU, uh, getting a master's degree and then just kind of piddling around. And uh, I was a visiting researcher for a few years. So, What were some of the labs you checked out so far? Uh, what are some of the things you were interested so in? I've I, I, I been mainly looking on the field robotics, which, is, which looks amazing. Um, a lot of very nice uh, engineering. I'm always, I, I try to understand like what is a gap because you have a lot of progress in robotics, but it doesn't go to the industry in the same level as it's been developed. Um, so I, I've been contacting in some manufacturing companies and they always say in a lot of time you have your own prototype and you have uh, and you build, uh, you know, uh, robots that come from here and put everything together and then it's come to manufacturing and if you don't have uh, huge quantities, they would say, okay, n so now let's simplify it and make a person to work on it because the, the price of um, multiplying a lot of stations um, and the ability to to manufacture uh, cheaply, it's like you're going back to the to the handwork and try to do it. As, <laughs> um, and and, and I, I try to to think what is uh, still the gap. Yeah. Um, Are you talking about after a process has been automated, or just after a product has been made ready for manufacture, in so, a smaller quantity? So I, I made like personally a, a product, a, a nice product. I build all the six axes it cost tens of thousands to make the machine everything controlled and in the end you know it's so it's your six axis machine that you or it's machined using a six axis cnc no it's, it's my my own design i didn't done it myself i was getting a lot of help and the uh, work done by others cool. it's not it's not only me uh, but you know, we, just be uh, a laser, or is this something else? Uh, so it's accurate positioning of uh, of glass fiber optics and this kind of things. Um, That's cool. Where do the six axes come in? So you're positioning in six axes, X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, yaw, or no? It's 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 I, I actually in I done X, Y, Z and X, Y, Z, and to put them together. Um, I now working on like so two compound X Y Zs. Yes. Okay, but that's if interesting. You, like, but if or two interacting with each other, and there's yeah, and you put the take one from here and one from here, and you just like pressure and dispensing and whatever. It's it's it's. it's I want to picture it, <laughs> so that's why I'm asking. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, yeah, it's 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 nice, but you know, as, first of all, it's. Everything that is 
very reliable, very accurate, it's very expensive, yes. still. Um, so it doesn't make sense to multiply this kind of a uh, system. Um, and in the end, you know, if you can do it manually, it's somehow it's coming back to that. And I, I'm wondering like, what is, what is still the gap there? Cause there is a, uh, Oh, I think I see. So you're saying that you engineered this, um, positioning system and it just didn't make sense to implement in the manufacturing process because people could position manually cheaper at the quantities that it would have been used for. Yes. And, and, okay. and, and, it's, Got it. and it's also like, if you want to make thousands of units, you need to, to be able to multiply your station by like one, 100 station like that. And the cost of multiplying. You can only get 10 stations. units out of each station or? I, I, don't, I don't want to make the math now, but okay. like, if you want to go to millions and you say, okay, so I need a million in a one year, it's dividing the days of the week, how much you can unit you can make by uh, um, an hour. And sometimes you are limited by factor, like if you're using uh, uh, UV adhesives, some of them... Cure time. Y yeah, you think that it's going to take seconds, but sometimes it takes minutes. And probably, I would think uh, climate as well would affect that. Um, humidity and temperature. Yeah, humidity and temperature, it, it, they are a factor, but you know, it's you don't see it as a time of manufacturing. Yeah. Um, but the time it takes to put, uh, position things, it takes minutes sometimes to make one unit. And if you can multiply it by, if you want to multiply by a thousand, if you want, each station can make 10, 100. So in a day you have limited number. If you want to have huge quantities, it's for the initial stage, you know, they, they it's make, make sense just going back to manuals, uh, walking and, um, and I think that a lot of times this is, this is what happens unless you're talking about huge quantities um, and that in uh, big companies and they, they making automated systems. But a lot of time, you know, they, you, the robotic cannot give answers to a lot of products and a lot of manual uh, for, um, production is made mainly in the East or other places. And because labor is cheaper. Labor is cheaper and still the, there is a problem in automating a lot of the uh, manufacturing processes. And even I, I, I saw in my life a lot of very, very complicated machine and you know, everything can be automated, but sometimes it doesn't make sense to, to, to automate system and you can like if you do, if you want to produce it within a month and you cannot be obligate for um, continuous manufacturing all the year or whatever say so I have a when I have a, a order of um, one million unit I will do it in a month and so it's a big manufacturing plate and they have their own kits and okay say uh, one one thousand workers will, will work on it for the next month and then they will change station and go to another place. This is, this is how it's done in the East, I think. Um, so there is some gap there. Yeah. Um, and so there, there is a, the cost of, of good equipment. And I think it's, it's a big issue, but well, the cost of programming too, the cost of tooling up, uh, I mean, the cost of taking it away from other customers, if you've got someone where you don't have to retool constantly and you've got another client that wants, you know, just five of something maybe every month, you know, I mean, it's not always you know, economical for a production house that just wants to pump the same thing through the same machine all day and not yes. have to retool. I'm going to talk a little bit outside my field here because I've only worked in production a little bit, <laughs> but I... Um, I feel like it's interesting to, to kind of see some of the reasons 
I do have a friend with a uh, CNC machining operation um, on the west coast of the United States who um, has been trying to figure out ways to put uh, job shop uh, orders through his production shop. And so he's only taken on orders that use the same size material as the product he's already making on the CNC machine. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's trying to set it up in a way where he can push a few units through and then put it back to production for his main products. I thought that was kind of clever, you know, to see, you know, there's there's ways to do it, but it's just not always intuitive or easy to do. And um, I don't know. What what are your thoughts here? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Just, uh, no, it's 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 you you're right. Like it's it's very like okay. It's it's a different field, like building and manufacturing uh, area. I I'm not such an expert in that. I saw it a few times in few companies and I don't like it's not the huge companies that in the state I have like a very small kind of experience in that um, but what's a lot of time you know if you have more than one or two products and you need to change your manufacturing line um, if Automating is, is, is a challenge. Yeah. Um, full automating. Of course, you can have certain um, tasks that are better. I saw like glass cutting, it's very mature um, market and you... How is that done? How do you cut glass? Because uh, I've seen like the score and crack method like for small quantities, but I'm guessing that's not how they do it on an industrial scale. It's, it's actually, yes, they do it the yeah. same. Yep, it's, it's just crack and you have a um, um, machine that just bend it and it goes the crack oh, goes wow. like that. And oh. you have, and, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. Like it's automatically uh, like a three axis, huge three axis. And it's going, it's, it's sucking the, the glasses, moving it along, and you need to, uh, and it breaks not exactly 90 degrees, and you need to, um, to make the shape right. And Is that a grinding so, operation at that point, or how would, you, how would you fix that? So they have been like the round tools, like rotors that goes around, you have each one is in the exact right curve and it just goes around and you're giving you exactly the the radius that you you need and it's it's been instead of having people cutting it by themselves or cutting and moving it's, it's just automated and in the end you get got it cut it glass and but then you need to bend it you need to and you they move it to a bending oven and this kind of thing or laminate elimination and this kind of things but if you wanted to make like the whole process in one machine you will need to have exactly like it's going to make only a laminated glass for buildings yeah. which can be done like the, probably there are companies that done it completely but if you have a little bit of versatility in the in your factory, so you will divide it to few stations, and a lot of time it makes problem. It it's, doesn't make sense to make it fully automated. I have um, sometimes it's fault because of little things. Um, I worked in a, a company that was uh, dealing with eggs. And Interesting. Yeah, and the, and the chickens make the eggs, and the, the, you need to pack it in the uh, in whatever tray that you you want, and you have like a very very long uh, chicken houses, and, and the eggs are coming, and you need to like if you want to manually, you just have a you can go there and pick, but no one will do it. You have a uh, system that bring it to one a uh, place for each chicken house but if you want to do it even more clever you need you can have a full system that brings the eggs like uh, 
trolleys in the airport to bring all the egg to one place. <laughs> and I saw they, they made like a fully automated one, you know, just sitting the main... Uh, when you say egg. trolleys, you mean like mobile robots transporting eggs in this case or conveyor belts still? Conveyor belts okay. still, yeah. Belts and, and they are going, they have some machines that picking the eggs, and you're just sitting there and looking. Um, but then they, I don't know, like in the end, it didn't work because it was a little bit more of rupture in the eggs. Ah. And they make the calculation and say, okay, it's cost us more than the manpower, and they just throw it. And it was like for years, it was rotting there, like inside the chicken house and you just no one will take care of like the huge system very costly that's unfortunate it's, yeah it was yeah, it's in the in the small details yeah uh, i can understand why they did that but it's also a shame as like a robotics person to not see a robot get built <laughs> yeah it, 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 it was a nice machine i really liked it but no it doesn't work it doesn't work and it, Back to manual system. You would know more about this than me, but maybe the semiconductor industry seems to be one industry that seems to be pretty damn well automated from everyone I've talked to that works there. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Um, they, they, they did a beautiful job. You have like beautiful machines, you know, it's like the motors there are working so fast you can almost cannot see <laughs> the, the motor moving and uh, it, it's, it's it's so fast nice. I, I saw some manufacturing I've been in some manufacturing lines like that and it, it's beautiful um, but this is this is a product that fits to that thing um, a lot of product doesn't work like that um, so you have a good machines, but sometimes you need to put in a, a man to operate them. Um, and I think that's the main reason why you still have manufacturing plate in in the East. That, and this is a big issue with China and United States and putting them work outside of the state. Um, China is, is just one example, but you have a lot of countries that is China not automating their processes though? Because I feel like they they they've got to be right. Like I've, I guess I've not really been out there, so I don't know. No, it's it's I I don't know how much, but is, is, is they did a revolution. I I feel I they don't get an, enough credit for that because they made um, a lot of product really cheap. And you know you can see it as a threat, but it's also it boosting so much of innovation. You know I can now buy cameras and a microscope in tens of dollars. Yeah, and it's it's nothing like compared to what yeah, I used to pay. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. and it's and, and it's, so it's also pushing a lot of the innovative process. You can you can get a certain part in very expensive from Europe or whatever, or you can do it in Aliexpress or in other <laughs> companies and you just Amazon. get it. Com. <laughs> yes, yes, and it's and it's cheap and, and it's accessible and and it's fun. Yeah. I you know, you know you say, okay, I'm going to waste another two hundred dollars and get another station working station. It's wow. And I think that a lot of like Chinese engineering on making process cheaper and give it an affordable prices. Um, it's it's a gift they gave the the world, and it's it's increasing the production also in the in the West. Uh, and it's not only Chinese, but a lot of uh, this is uh, the example uh, the the more accessible example. Um, yeah. But is there a, a, a way to make this processes that come out of the, of the United States and Western countries and bring them back? Um, I really like, I don't know if, if I have a positive answer for that because you can do it with robots, yes. Yeah. But 
For now, the robots are not there. Yeah. I mean, they are getting very close, though. And I mean, for mass manufacturing, I feel like we do have pretty good ability to make things with robots. Like, I've been to some um, automotive manufacturing facilities in the United States where it's really impressive, you know, like, we're still making engines here, and we're still making transmissions here. And, you know, we're still making, I mean, full cars here as far as I know, but I've really only been inside engine and transmission plants. But um, that was impressive, just seeing hundreds of robots, you know, in one facility working together to make, I mean, admittedly the same thing over and over again. So, you know, that's what you and I talked about, which is, you know, high mix versus low mix. This is low mix. It's easier to automate um, and also high volume, which is more economical to automate. And therefore there's a business case for it. But um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's not as far off as, as you, as you seem to be saying it might be because we, we have it. I mean, you're talking about glass, right? But I guess to automate everything, like in every small industry, to automate small quantity manufacturing is we're still not there. But you know, the glasses in the Western countries are like glass industry is just going out of Western countries. You see it in, in Facebook. I, I saw it in a few factories. The price of sales that they, the Chinese make, send it to, to, to Israel. It was the, the price of manufacturing inside Israel. Like the, the cost of the product was the same cost as it's cost us to make without getting any profit. Oh, wow. Um, and so you see a lot of the... So there's no way to compete with that. No way to compete with that. Um, I have heard some of that is subsidized by the Chinese government. I don't know to what extent that's still true. I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to think about it. It's, it's a, give you an excuse. But uh, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know how and the, the, probably the profit is really low when you um, and you make all the parts really, really not so expensive. Um, but I don't know, I see it's also in optics. When they, they, you try to buy optics from wherever you want, it's either made in the East or, or it's much more expensive. Yeah. You can find beautiful optics in the state, like state of the art, but paying a few thousand of dollars for one piece and, and you're going to your Chinese friend and he's saying, oh, I got it in a, it's, it's $20 per piece and the same yeah. piece. <laughs> and th That's wild. In, 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 I tested th those glasses and you know, I got the same, qualities like they, they have a difference in in few things but for what's my need it was it gave us the same result and it's a um, you cannot compete with that like uh, but i also think that a lot of western companies are uh, allowed themselves to ask for high prices and that is something that th they need to find a way to to decrease prices and it's it's holding the um, the production and um, making new products if you need like five glasses like that cost a few thousand dollars you cannot manufacture anything that is a low cost and then you need to the lasers will be more expensive and then whatever so i don't know if the optics is subsidized by the chinese government i would guess yes because but i i don't know yeah i mean there's got to be somebody getting incentivized to make that stuff right so you figure you know like and again this is kind of, I'm sort of speaking outside my knowledge here, so I don't want to say too much because it's just outside my realm of expertise. I'm, I'm a research and development specialist, which is far from what we're talking about. But, um, 
you just have to you have to wonder you know like what the motivation is to to sell stuff that low i mean i guess if that labor market still is low but i feel like it's it's been going up right i mean like people are making better money in china now than they used to like 10 years ago or even 20 years ago um i mean i don't know if, how much better it is or i i don't know what the average factory worker gets paid there but I know that China's been, um, or I've heard, I should say, that China's been shopping out some of their, you know, labor to, you know, like the continent of Africa, because the labor there is cheaper than the labor in China now. And so I don't know to what extent that's true or how exactly it works. I don't want to, again, speak too much outside of my expertise, but I, you know, I kind of just wonder... Um, and I know there are things that we're still competitive on, I mean, over here, like, for instance, I mean, what I do with research and development, I mean, you know, I, I know there's still a market for B2B research and development services, uh, business to business, you know, if you're competent and, and you have, you know, a level of skill that dictates the pricing, you know, that you can charge, even if, you know, it might seem like a premium price, like it, it you know, if you want premium people, like a lot of companies seem to realize that it's it's you know worth paying you know for quality so I, I don't know to what extent that extends to consumer goods I suspect not as much so you know what you're saying I think is you more applied to mass production so um, but you know I mean I guess businesses don't want to overpay but you know to what extent can you get better quality or a more reliable supply chain or I don't know I'm just trying to be devil's advocate here <laughs> So I, I, I just don't possess enough expertise in this area. I feel like to to be super dangerous, but um, yeah. So I saw a lot of a lot of the markets are saying, okay. So you, this is the reason why a lot of companies invest so much in R and D because you you want to go forward with your market, and if you are stuck like the, the manual system and the low labor will, uh, will win the market. Um, so I saw companies going to a higher, uh, more um, developed product, um, new type of glasses, um, high, bigger size, um, very complicated curvatures, this kind of stuff. Oh, interesting. So, and, and so that's just meant to be like barriers to competition by making something that hasn't been made cheap yet? Or is that... Yeah, so you yeah. see a lot of the companies going there, like try to, to make the innovation and find the next new stuff. And if you are stuck too, too much time in the same product, well, the... the the, we are always scared that someone will try and copy, but you have a lower cost of manufacturing. You don't have the, the um, non-return investment in the beginning. Um, and, and, and he will win, like, and you, don't, you cannot compete with his manufacturing cost. So all the market is pushed to to have a better product and if you are stuck and your market is stuck yeah um you are you you will find someone pushing in pushing you out of the market and so like so bending cars windows um the, the companies that i work in in israel just stopped making it and they moved to buses and buses also had a uh, huge competition and you are going to whatever other complicated windows but like windows flat windows for um for buildings it's, uh, in israel i i know that it was the man the market was long long gone out of israel it's it's to simple products. Yeah, I mean, we don't make textiles really in the U.S. anymore. There's been talk of doing it with robots, and there's been some recent research by a friend of mine's company, Sobo and Siemens, uh, using a stiffening agent to make fabric rigid. 
so that you can robotically put it through a sewing machine. So you use a robot to feed it through. And that seems to be an interesting early stage development from the perspective of automating textiles. I don't fully understand the market there, but I don't know. I mean, I guess that's that's sort of what you're alluding to is things like that, right? Yeah, I, I like it was a huge market in Israel also, and it's it's yeah. gone away. Like, they just yeah. uh, one of the last factories was closed a few years ago, and and goodbye. Um, yeah, but do you think goodbye forever, or do you think like? So that that's a question. If because eventually, you know the when you send like I mean I don't know like the U S used to be a sweatshop for Great Britain, right? Like back in you know the. 1700s or whatever and so you know and we were doing well because we had all the sweatshop revenue and you know our standard of living got higher and higher and higher and then eventually the u.s wasn't really as much of a sweatshop and certain industries moved away you know and to countries that weren't doing as well economically but i feel like with what we're describing with a lot of stuff moving over to somewhere else i mean eventually that country seems like they're going to start doing really well and I feel like you're seeing this in China, like with like a new rich and they're automating their manufacturing more and they're moving into labor markets and other countries. Um, like, I think it just keeps moving. Right. And then like eventually, you know, can it stabilize by itself? It, it's got it. Right. Like eventually. I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, it, that would seem to be the and this is kind of me going back to being an economics student you know, <laughs> years ago. But. Yeah, so like the, it, it, it can't, it's not like an indefinite Ponzi scheme. Like eventually it's going to, like the market catches up, right? Um, yes. So my question is, is, can the wheel can be turned backward by robotics? And I, I was, in the beginning, I was hoping yes, but we are not there yet. Like it's, it's, it's still not there. And I am trying to think what can be um, holding us. So is there is a lot of decision to uh, take in the middle of the process. You know, you need to take the shirt and see that it's, it's right. You can make a robot that does it and maybe does it very fast, but it's going to be very expensive and some like the human is very very good in analyzing visual data yes yeah. uh, this but, is but, our best i mean new algorithms can do that too i mean i don't know there's yeah yes or... but you know I, but we are not it's so much easier to do it by hand um can it be yeah. done backward like if you want to make such kind of robot and I see you are starting to think how how could you do it and the algorithm and it's going to be a challenge. The question is, can you do it less challenging and less um, and affordable and can can an engineer take uh, this kind of, of uh, task and within two weeks come with a, with a solution? And I think when we are, we will be in this stage, we can talk about putting a lot of the manufacturing back to Western countries. There is an additional cost and it's always a very tight balance. Um, there is uh, a building, the, the building are more expensive and transportation could be more expensive and there are taxes and, but a lot, a lot of the products can be, and but you have some advantages. You know, it's less, less delivering. Um, um, you are not afraid of uh, having uh, manufacturing um, knowledge going to other places. You have a lot of benefit in manufacturing near your market. So I, I, I really hope that we will have the, that the robotic will continue to evolve to the stage when it's make, made m much cheaper and accessible and, and and we can see companies that coming back to the Western countries um, because it makes sense economically. Yeah. 
I don't know. I'm going to keep doing research and development because that's what I'm good at. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I... <laughs> and you are really good at that. I, well, I saw a few of your products. It's, wow. It's, it's nice things. It's very kind of you. <laughs> I think you are too. I mean, I, I read your resume and I, I looked at some of the stuff you had worked on. And I, I mean, obviously I was impressed. <laughs> like, so what are some of the things you saw, I guess, when you were at Carnegie Mellon that made you sort of see some future technology that you were interested in? So it, it's... Because I haven't been to the Field Robotics Center in a few years. Every time I go, I, I, I get really happy to see Chuck Whitaker because him and I are or homies, like I, I like that guy a lot. I spend a lot of late nights in there with him in the machine shop and you know, he taught me how to use certain tools and um, I'll always have a spot in my heart for him. I keep wanting to get him on this podcast, but you know, he doesn't have a whole lot of interest in publicity. Uh -huh. So uh, I don't know, what are they up to these days? So uh, I, I, I've been like, I, I've been touring around, so I saw a lot of like the space things and it you say, okay, they test it here and it's in the moon and it's so, so that sounds like the planetary robotics high bay is where you are in the gates hellman building yes okay yeah, yeah I, I so this this is one one of places and i been, main, mainly was going outside the um, the big lab there um and you have the the snake which is that would be how he chose its bio robotics lab on a level of NSH, I think. Yeah, and you have the in the the water robots and so it was yeah. it was nice that's to see. That's from the FRC, I think. Yeah, I, I really. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. And you yeah, see how much thinking was invested in this kind of technologies. Um, yeah, they're not dumb. Like, <laughs> no, no, they are like they did like um, amazing engineering. Well, it's also like amazing what they get just from having the uh, students pass through there that are early in their careers. So they get access to what's well, an interesting business model. Well, business is probably the wrong word because technically Carnegie Mellon's a nonprofit, but it's an interesting, uh, I'll just call it a business model. It's an interesting business model because you've got students that are incredibly intelligent. Like they're going to go out and, you know, be world experts and, you know, whatever their fields are. But they don't have a whole lot of experience yet, so they're still making sort of rookie mistakes. So it's an interesting sort of blend of, you know, incredibly just big minds, but without the experience. I know that's how I was when I was there. <laughs> like, I was, I was smart, but I was, I was naive. And, um, you know, I made a lot of rookie mistakes. Like, for instance, um, a buddy of mine, uh, Jim Picard, who is um, one of the, he's sort of like a, um, I don't know how I'd refer to him. I guess he's a technician um, or maybe, you know, some kind of um, robotics engineer, but he's doing a lot of the assembly tasks on these robots. I think he worked for Howie Chose it for a while and then George Cantor, I think. Could be wrong. Sorry, Jim, if uh, you're listening, buddy. But uh, just correct me and I'll, I'll put it in the text. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, he showed me a, a panel on a robot um, where it was made... Um, to, to fit uh, over an electronics bay, but you couldn't actually pull the panel all the way out because there were a bunch of bars for other stuff on the other side of it. So it was, wasn't was designed with regard to um, ease of assembly and disassembly and serviceability. But, you know, that's the sort of thing you just learn when you've, you've been doing it for so many years because you've had to service enough robots that you think about that stuff. But you just don't think about that earlier in your career because you don't have the experience to start, you know, thinking a few steps ahead with regard to things you've done before because you haven't done them yet, if that makes sense. So, so. I, I saw a lot of time when, like, you get in engineers fresh from the academia in certain places. They have a lot of theoretical knowledge, but very low uh, knowledge of how to do things. They, sometimes you need to explain them how to take the, the screwdriver and how to hold the tools and because they didn't learn about it. They have like a analyze, analysis of a fluids or whatever. They, have, uh, they learn very, very complicated courses, but a lot of time it takes them, they don't have the field experience. 
And if they found the, the way to bridge that and to bring engineers that uh, have a field experience, uh, and the PIs sometimes they are not there, like they, they know how to write the grants, they thinking big, they know the technologies, but they don't need sometimes, and a lot of them, um, it's, it's a waste of time for them to know all the, the details. And if you have staff that knows it and can teach the, ki the, the new student, I think that's, I like the model. Um, yeah. That was nice. Yeah, and me too. A another nice thing that I found is there are some maker space in Pittsburgh. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Uh, I guess the main ones I know about right now, I think Proto Haven, if they're still around. Is Factory Unlocked still a thing? Like, I don't know if they're still around anymore. I, I haven't saw them. There is a Hack PGH. Oh, interesting. I tried to donate some stuff to them a while ago, and it was hard to get a hold of them to make a donation. But the Hack PGH? Do, yeah, they do have a cool space. They have Just, a very friendly cool. environment. Though. Yeah, I, yeah. I, so I, I, but every space has its own benefits. But it's amazing to see so much people are engaged in making stuff um, and a lot of time it's without so much of profit like in, in terms of money but more like oh I just love to do it and you know software engineers just love 3D, 3D printing <laughs> um, uh, just people just like like to make yeah. um and it's it's amazing a uh, to to see so many people that are onto this kind of thing and get excited like me from oh that's so cool what you can do it from, from that i don't know but it's it's cool what are some of the things you've made like as a hobbyist you know that you're proud of so i i moved from one thing to another i used to do wood and to build things when i was younger um, i built a lot of my house uh, cool. yeah it's 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 always fun um I, I did a lot of woodworking when i was younger as well yeah it's it's give you the feeling of, of creation creating well it's kind of forgiving too like i feel like you can you can get away with a lot of sin with wood that you can't necessarily get away with with metal um, in terms of just alignment issues and you know you don't really have to have the same sort of precision uh, there in order to make it work yes like you can just kind of like you know yeah, like just screw it, from it. that and yeah. uh, yeah. take it out put it from another place fill it and, and you're done you're okay yeah <laughs> yeah it looks great um, and, and it's simple to to design you know, yeah. with, with the sketching and and just giving factory uh, the list of materials that you want they cut it and shape it and you just need to to put it in place or, or you can do more or less whatever you want but it's yeah. it, that was real fun and I recent years I in in love with the 3d printing I oh, just cool. I love the technologies. I, I think it's like a uh, knob. I still haven't bought one yet. <laughs> I, I should. For a while, I was trying to make make one um, with a heated enclosed build chamber, uh, and the goal was to try to print dimensionally stable polycarbonate. And I wanted to do that for a few reasons. One was I wanted the machine. And another one was I wanted to be able to show off and say I was able to do it. And another one is I wanted to make it really pretty like a showpiece because um, it was sort of early on in my career so I didn't have a whole lot of portfolio pieces and so um, I ended up not finishing it because it was just getting to be ridiculously expensive but I uh, and because of that I, I should probably just buy a 3d printer because I feel like when I'm trying to build something I won't let myself buy the thing because it removes the incentive to finish building it but now that I'm not trying to build it anymore like why don't I just buy a 3D printer? I guess I should. Which one's... Oh, sorry. It's, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's rising technologies, and every year you get a better products, and 
better material set. Sounds like a shwet. I think that prices went so low. Yeah. So you can probably afford it quite quickly. Like you can get um, really basic things in few hundred, like, Two hundred dollars, and you you got a two D printer, a, a, a nice one. Five hundred, you get a very good one. One thousand, Prusa, which is quite the standard thing, and you can go higher and higher. But if you want just to print stuff for for fun or for, um, I, I needed I I had it as a hobby, and afterward when my one of one of my job i just brought it inside manufacturing line and you can just uh, you have you, you need something to hold and instead of improvising and buying a lot of stuff you just print it test it and when you have it it's always you need to remember to to do it for metal in the end because plastic is if you don't want to manufacture thing a lot of times the plastic will change its dimension or whatever. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, yeah. I, I now see it everywhere, every, every place you have mechanical engineer, not every place, but a lot of the place they will, first of all, will print it a CDR, like complete design review without, of, um, of a complicated system goes much faster when you have a, uh, the prototype in, in front of your eyes and you can say oh but how, i wanted to have a hole also here and from and it's it's a great way to communicating uh a product uh yeah, system okay. optical design whatever that it's, it's it's a great and and also to just manufacturing small tools or small holders and you want the camera just to come in this angle print it and hold it and improvise it's a great tool for R&D and so I I was I had it as a hobby I brought it to work and stopped printing it at home but now I'm I'm back to it and it's it's fun I I learning uh, mechanical engineering uh, softwares like uh, SolidWorks yeah, yeah I love SolidWorks yeah so I, I eventually I always had the dream to to start and love's a strong word. I like SolidWorks a lot. <laughs> yeah, as, as they are, it, it, I, I have a issue. I used to work in Fusion 360, which is great. Um, they reduced uh, the free modes that they had, um, which sucks a little bit. Yeah. Um, SolidWorks ain't cheap. I think my license was $12,000. Yes, like yes, that. they are very, very expensive. Yeah. I finally find a solution how to to use them as a consulting for one of the company. I get the license and nice. it's a, it's nice. Um, I found it that infusion. It's sometimes um, when you are getting more and more complicated design, it's hard to keep up infusion and. At the time, I needed to take some order, throw it out, and build it from the beginning because I had problems in SolidWorks. It's very, it's taking a lot of a lot more time to design things. You can improvise. I, for me, it's taking still longer time to make it in solid. But when you know you have a separate part, you can build the system. You can move it much much easily yeah easily. well i think building good discipline with SolidWorks is important too because it's very easy to do um like extrudes from the corner and you know have your origin like off the side of the pro project but like somebody early on in my career told me that i should mid-plane extrude every first extrusion in a SolidWorks, and i should put the origin at the center of the of the geometry for that extrusion and that that really helped me because it's a lot easier to locate parts to each other if they all have like origins right in the center and so little things like that i feel like you kind of pick up over the years i still i i designed some sensor enclosures for an autonomous robot in solidworks um 
that, I mean, they're overly complicated. I, I was maybe being a little bit show offy when I, I came up with them and, you know, it was sort of a passion project. So I put a lot of time in and I might have like 40 hours into some of these enclosures or like 80 hours into some of them. Um, but they have a lot of lofts and sweeps and just more advanced Celeworks geometric features. Um, not the most advanced. There's stuff I don't know how to do with, you know, like contour, uh, meshing and crap that Celeworks can do where it gets really complicated, but it's endless. Yeah. It's endless. I try now to see if we can also do like, uh, the design, the, I, I need to, to, to work with surfaces now. It's, it's a new model that I'm learning now. But it's, it's, it's nice. I have the opportunity to go to mechanical engineering and to add it to my list of uh, know-hows. It's, it's really fun. So, and I'm, I'm playing now with like, uh, mechanical models that you can print in one piece. And um, I hope that we'll have a few of them in the next few weeks. Um, so th that's, that's, that's my hobby for now. Um, nice. and so I, I, I mainly like have the morning hours with my colleagues in Israel and later on I do a little bit of my job and, and play a little bit. I just now engage in Proto Heaven. So it's, it's, it's fun. It's really fun. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. I, um. I haven't spent a whole lot of time at Proto Haven, but it seems like a good group of people they got over there. Like, I don't know. I will see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm just, I don't know. I think, well, I mean, you, I guess you engineer for work too. So that's interesting because for me, I, I've been doing this so many years and like as a hobbyist, I mean, I, I started building things when I was seven years old. So I don't know, maybe it's dumb, but at a certain point, just maker spaces, I think for me, have sort of lost their appeal a little bit where I don't want to be a Grinch, but at the same time, it's, I don't know, I, I feel like it's just a different set of incentives and interests, like you said, like the fact that people aren't care concerned about like monetary gain or making things, um, you know, for industrial purposes is, is kind of fun. But also like, I don't know, I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm so focused on making things right now for, you know, how do I, you know, make this something that people would like to spend money on or how do I build something that, you know, benefits, you know, in some way. What was really fun, I guess, to, to go back a step and stop being so cynical is during the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you remember like 2020 when everyone was isolated, but um, I remember... Um, we volunteered um, like a bunch of us at SKA to make face shields and we were able to make more of them than a local makerspace made <laughs> just by, um, we, we had a design that was a little bit more optimized for production than theirs. So they were, I think, 3D printing critical frame components and we did everything on a laser cutter. So it was a much faster cycle time and then we made jigs. So we, we spent a bunch of hours making jigs to cut the elastic for the bands that went around the back and making jigs to cut the um, PETG blanks that would go in the laser cutter. Um, and then, you know, we like broke down into an assembly line and it was all volunteer stuff. So it wasn't for monetary gain. We just gave them away. But it was kind of fun just to, to try to, you know, see how many we could make. And, you know, a lot of the limitation was on the amount of material you could get. Like, I think there was only so much PETG and elastic, you know, it was easy to lay your hands on. And I mean, to be fair, we were all working on volunteer labor. So, I mean, people didn't want to make that many, but we made like 750 of them. So. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's impressive. Yeah. So for, for me, it's appealing because I, I'm here. I'm not going to buy too many tools here and ship yeah. them back to Israel. So you have everything accessible there and there are machines that you don't have any um, motivation in, in, having in your house um, so there are a lot of mechanics that you can like mechanic tools that you can manufacture you know you send the drawing to China or to a workshop and it's coming back to you a lot of time you manufacturing like you cannot do it by yourself but if you have a need for a, you know 
a specific metal part and you don't have the tools this kind of places are a great solution I yeah I wish I had more access to them in earlier stage of my career that I, makes a lot of sense when I, I was really happy the first time I read like a make magazine or you know I, I realized that culture was a thing like it did make me happy that there was a group of people out there somewhere that were just unified by their desire to build stuff so 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 part of like doing a 3d printing is to find models around the internet and just print them for 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 fun or I I have kids for excuse um, now I, I I bought a 3d printer to my house here um, and I just point to the kids like puzzles and they, and they have a fifth grader and he's coming with a puzzle every day <laughs> a new puzzle and they and they are sitting together as a friend and trying to solve the, the puzzle together and it, it's 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 cute or he just found the way yeah, to do it really and <laughs> it's 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 a and I see it as a educational things for the kids and it's also fun for me but it's um, it's nice so but there is a community someone and you know that sometimes this kind of puzzles can take you tens of hours to make with the design uh, with the thinking with just just a cube like that can can take a lot of time to make yeah um, and knowing that there is someone over the world that thought about it and you see that they have a lot of time in the note you have six versions and you know each version probably took him a lot of time you have like articulated dragons or whatever uh, snakes or, or other pieces of really nice 3D prints and you say wow someone gave it for free and and it's amazing you know I, I was playing with that for a long long time it's getting harder to find cool models sometimes after you you everything that in things giver and the uh, other sites uh, but uh, I, you still find a lot of new stuff cool stuff and that's pretty cool and and there is in in it's done all for free and a lot of time you have a model that you can you need to print to pay to print and that's fair like if you if you're willing to 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 pay and uh, but a lot of time it's yeah we're just looking for the free stuff and another toy for the kids tomorrow morning uh, <laughs> My, before I went to, went here, my kids asked me if I can 3D print one of the puzzles for his friend. I say, okay, well, do it. Is it the same one that that he had, or is it? Yeah, like, okay. it's on. It's already so on. That's the pretty disc. cool that you can just have it again because you've already you know, yeah. done it. You know it works. You've proven it. I hope that he, he will succeed. I will come home and see if he. He managed to to solve it. If not, I will uh, to to print it. If not, I will do it, of course. But it's 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 cool, and I think it's also. Uh, I I was born. I, the thing that I really like to do as a kid is to solve puzzles and riddles and this kind of things. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy that I can give my son the the, the possibilities to yeah. to have complicated puzzles and that's pretty cool well one of my coworkers just bought a 3d printer for his daughter too and so i mean it and i've met his daughter and she's really smart and i'm sure your son's also pretty smart because he's your son <laughs> so, i mean that's that's neat that kids i guess are, are growing up now with the ability to just make a thing which means that the, now they can learn cad because you know mm -hmm. i mean if they have access to solidworks or you know the Fusion 360 or... Yeah, think think card for kids, but yeah. <laughs> when I was in high school, the big one was uh, Autodesk Inventor. That was... Like, they gave it away for free to high school students, but I didn't have anything until then. So, like, I mean, I guess when I was in the middle school, it was, you know, the early 2000s, late 90s. So the technology would have still been probably relegated to engineering and, like, 2D AutoCAD, you know. I, I don't know if it's happened also to you, but a lot of time you're just thinking about idea, like 
and, and you want to, to visualize it and, and print it and so you just sketch it and, and yeah. print it and it's it's amazing I I know putting toys that I was playing as a kid I just model them and I see if it's if it works I have to to upload to to some free sites and to have people play with that I've got a stupid question but I'm, I'm itching to ask it and so when you came in earlier uh, we're recording this on like a Saturday night and I asked if you kept the, sh the Sabbath and, and you said you did which for people listening that's like Jewish people like Friday at sundown you know you basically don't use like I guess originally it was fire but now it translates to electricity um, and then handle money or like do commerce and you relax so and I know you're not supposed to do that, but if a 3D printer is running and sundown on Friday happens, like, do you just let it run or do you, do you have to like turn it off before if you're really trying to be observant? <laughs> Sorry. No, so, so I think everyone agrees that it's, it can run by itself. Nice. The question is if you can use it exactly after Saturday or you need to wait until it's like, don't use Saturday as an excuse, but I, I don't know. I probably it's, it's good. Oh, I see. So because it stopped. So if you just grab the thing, so, you know, no, so you're just grabbing a thing. You're not actually using electricity. You're just grabbing a thing off a building. So, so so that that's like grabbing the thing and, and breaking it to so it's without work. It's definitely a work. You you are not allowed to do no. it. <laughs> but the question if you can grab it exactly after Saturday or you need to wait a little bit of time. For it to be done, I, I need to think about it. But it's um, it's very interesting to have a sh Saturday Shabbat. Um, it's a lot of sacrifice as a modern a, an engineer, and, and you need to stop and put your phone down and whatever. But it's a there's a lot I agree with putting your phone down. I think that's the right way to live your life. <laughs> I don't know, but, but have you? So it's it's fun, like yeah. to have the the possibility. And I don't do it for people funny. listening. So we're, that's just what we we're debating earlier. <laughs> but it yeah, seems uh, like it could be a healthy thing, which is why I'm like I'm not like it, it. It strikes me. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but it strikes me as like a lot of people I know that do it say what you said, which is it's nice to have some time to hang out with your family, to be able to take a break. And just you know, know that you know you're not going to be able to find excuses to have to get into work. And then I, I know families that'll like sing songs together, and you know they get it's pretty cute. Like they'll they'll really get into it. And I mean I like visiting those houses because I feel like you know like that seems like a nice family, you know, and it's kind of yeah fun to be a part of it. I I I also feel like that. It's I think it's given me a lot. But uh, uh, truth must be said, like if it's give you a lot or doesn't give you a lot, this is how how we understand the God's commands, and this is what we do. Like it could have benefits or <laughs> <laughs> disadvantages, but yeah. you know this is the rules. You need to play by the rules as you understand it. Like yeah. I, like whoever uh, want to interpret them, it's a uh, the personal opinion and whatever I don't try to convince convince anyone. But no, I, I didn't think that, and and I, hopefully I don't sound like I'm you know thinking that my way of doing things is better than yours because I don't think that either. No, it's, I'm it's, just interested in you know seeing a different perspective than mine. But being a Jew in the United States and in Israel, it's very different, uh, um, and it's interesting to see how. Judaism hears look compared to Israel, but it's how is it different? Because I, I would assume in Israel pretty much everyone's Jewish. Like I would think from the people I've met, at least a lot so of them are Jewish. You, yeah. Of course, you have a, a lot of Arabs also, yeah. um, a, but not all are Orthodox. A lot of them, like I think, them still the majority is not Orthodox. But you what are the majority? Um, seculars. Okay, so that's like like me. 
Yes. I'm, I'm like an atheist, really, but I grew up as a Reformed Jew. So. Uh. Yeah, yeah. You just you you keep whatever you want to keep, and yeah. but if you are if you want to have Hanukkah feelings, you don't like to feel like it's Hanukkah. You just go to the street and see candles everywhere. Yeah. And in the state, you need to to go there and 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 be. If you cho choose to be Jew, you need to be active. In Israel, you need to yeah. you can do it passively, yeah. and that makes a lot of difference. But that's interesting. That's actually that's really interesting because yeah, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought about that. I guess it, in the United States, it's kind of funny that you say that because I feel like you know Hanukkah obviously is around the same time as Christmas, and so my <laughs> I got invited to like a Christmas Eve celebration this year by my Jewish aunt. And then, you know, my Jewish parents invited me out for Christmas Day <laughs> to hang out with them in New York. It's like we've almost just given up and been like, yeah, fuck it. There's more people celebrating Christmas. So I guess we'll just do that this year, which I don't necessarily think is like a, you know, it's kind of fun, like I said, to experience other points of view. So it's sort of enjoyable to be a tourist into that holiday and see, you know, how people are doing that. But um, at the same time, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's fun to light some candles too. And you know, they they kind of they kind of bait and switch because like yeah, come out for Christmas and then we let the menorah, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> everything so. together. But, yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I, I grew up as a, a Orthodox Jew, and I but I find it very exciting to to think that like I continue the tradition, a long time tradition, and I I I can meet with my grand 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 grandfather father and and learn together or go to school together and we could say same text and I could I, I for me it's 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 a great feeling and I, I try to teach it to my kids and nice. to give them that you know I, I, I can to to be part of of something that is much bigger than you um, you know, I, I like it. I, I this is my way of life, and I'm yeah. I can dig that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, I'm I don't know. I'm happy to be like kind of like a small part of the Jewish community. I'm not super duper active, but it is something that Pittsburgh's got a very good Jewish community compared to some of the other cities in the U.S. I've lived in, and I know it probably doesn't seem like it since you're coming from Israel, but. I, I lived in upstate New York for a little bit, and you know there were not a whole lot of Jewish people there, so it was, it was weird because I I grew up in Squirrel Hill, which is a very Jewish neighborhood of Pittsburgh. It and, is. Um, I'm I'm there now. I it's, uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> so we both drove from there <laughs> to be here, um, but I just remember being really surprised because I grew up there, and and when I was in high school in upstate New York, like I was like the only Jewish person there, and I was like, oh, I'm really. Not that many of us, you know, it's so, like it was it's kind of interesting. And I, I still, you know, I mean, do identify with other Jewish people in a lot of ways and maybe not in every way. And I, I'm not religious, obviously, but I don't know. Like you said, it's, it's kind of cool to be some part of something bigger than yourself. And, you know, I feel like that doesn't just extend to, you know, race or religion like that also extends to. And this take it back industry, like I feel like it extends to some of the projects, you know, we've gotten to work on. Like when I worked at um, SpaceX, for instance, I felt like it was really cool to be a part of the space program in some small way. And, you know, that felt bigger than me. And I, I was, you know, really happy to sort of get to contribute a little bit. And some of the projects I'm working on now that I can't talk about on the air, <laughs> like really proud to, to be able to contribute to and. I think it's also the the reason why a lot of uh, um, projects that involve working for the militaries are much more appealing than other projects because you you feeling that you are contributing. You're not just not only about about the money and not yeah. only about a, a personal profit from with each kind that you can think about. But it's you, you. You gave to the community. You gave to the army. You gave to yeah. the country. Um, and it, it's actually, I've been working in kind of industry that around the 
security for almost 10, eight years. So, and finally I, I nice. moved up to it and, and it's, it's weird. It's a, okay, so it's only money. So being a part of something bigger or for like doing for a better reason, it's sometimes give you a lot of uh, energy and motivation. And I think this yeah. is what ways that people a lot of time uh, volunteering just to be a part of something bigger and, and it's a, a great force. Yeah. I mean, you can find when the money intersects with something you're really proud of, that's like the dream, I feel like. But Yes, yeah. yes. It's a... Uh, oh. It's uh, the sweet point that you always need to to yeah. find. And it's not always easy. No. I think I'd rather do something for less money that I was proud of or interested in than something for more money that I just didn't. Obviously, there's a there's like a curve there, you know. Like there's, I guess, a certain amount of money where you know the interest doesn't matter anymore. You know, if you could have enough money to retire in one year and you know your family is going to be set forever you'd probably do the most boring job in the world but you know or you know if you were making so little that you couldn't even feed yourself you know or anyone else then you know maybe it doesn't matter how interesting the job is because you just don't you can't afford to do it i um i met someone recently that worked for the uh the science center here in pittsburgh and it was a really cool job and um but the people didn't make that much money. Like, I think they were earning, like, I probably shouldn't say, but not a lot of money. And um, one of his coworkers said to him something I really liked, which was, it's a great job if you can afford it. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I have sisters, and one time one of them just called me and said, okay, I want to to learn social studies and to be a social worker and i don't know how it's here in the state but in israel you cannot get a high salary in, in that yeah i think it's similar here and but but it's given a great satisfaction and so and so i i told her like you know maybe if that's the only thing that interests you like go for it but if you find, try to do another thing with that, like learn economics or be a lawyer. Or, and I, I, I did this conversation with two of my sisters and they are very happy with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they both wanted to do, do one thing and in the end they end up doing the other thing. And Are they lawyers now or like what do they do? So one of them is a a lawyer and the other one is a so and the other one is is in economics and the third one is in the oh. government government service that's interesting yeah but you doing, doing like i am very government proud. service could be anything what is what does she do like kind of more specifically so actually it's two of them working in the like government service one of them is Response. She just cha- changed jobs, but she's uh, making the contracts for. Um, um, she was doing the, making the contract for all the social uh, services. So nice. she she came from social <laughs> studies and say, okay, I'm doing economics, but then she came back from like, how do you quantize uh, social services that the uh, government give you and like making um, houses for kids without parents um, how do you measure the quantity of a uh, quality of service so I'm yeah and uh, like so each one of them found a, a way but I my parent my father was a research and history cool. and my grandfather was there like doing history and my grand like my aunt was in history and i was my grandmother was in history so i, I i'm the black sheep i come <laughs> to the engineering and the yeah. physics and science and it's fun yeah. it's fun it's it's 
this was my long passion. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, my dad's my dad's a doctor. My mom's a lawyer. Um, and then, oh, this is uh, the Jewish dream, no? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and then um, my, my grandparents, my granddad's a doctor on my dad's side and my grandmother's the historian. And then my mom's side, I think, I don't know if her mom actually worked. I think she was kind of like, just like a career wife. And then the father was like some kind of captain of industry. Like um, I think he was like some kind of engineer or like executive or both. I, I, I never met the guy, but yeah. Um, do you feel that there is less engineers, like more imported engineers in the state than before? Like, I, I As opposed to lot, when? I, I saw a lot of guys that immigrated as engineers and I, I, I hear like... Yeah, but that's always been the case. I mean, yes. well, the whole U.S. space program is based off of like German engineers that immigrated, you know, from like the Nazi space program. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like there's got to be other examples of that, right? Where we've we've staffed, you know, an industry with with people that came here that were already good at a thing. Um yeah, I don't know. Um when when are you referring to in particular that you're thinking of? So I I I talked with a lot of people and they say there are more and more like immigrants that are uh, immigrate as engineers in the last five years in the last 10 years in the last yeah. 20 years in the last less, 50 years. less 10 years i think okay. but i i'm not there i just was so if i'm thinking 10 years back um hmm well the thing is i just wasn't as active in industry then i mean i was i'm i'm only 34 years old so i, I was i was out doing some stuff and i i mean I think when I started interacting with more uh, more immigrant engineers was probably like the most like the biggest inflection point for me personally in my career was when I was in grad school and I saw the people at Carnegie Mellon and I was in a 40 person master's class and of those five of them were U.S. citizens, you know, and so Whoa. and so, yeah, uh, interesting. But, you know, I thought, like, I mean, if, if these are supposed to be the smartest people from all over the world, I mean, it kind of makes sense that just statistically, you know, not a whole lot of them are going to be local. And so and I think they get more money from international students. I think uh, I don't know if my master's school in particular is that way, but I think a lot of the CMU tuition is like more expensive if you're coming in internationally. And so from the school's perspective, it probably makes sense to make that money <laughs> if a limited number of seats. But it's like, I feel like it's less of a pass that parents will teach their kids to be engineers, except like, and push them to be other things. Yeah, but someone somewhere is doing that, right? If we're getting these immigrants that want to be here. I mean, I don't know. You came here as an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. fair enough. Like, I, it, it's 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 a good place to be in, and yeah. it, it's great. Um, but I I'm wondering why like the American a lot of the American left this yeah. field and gone to other places. It's, That's it's a good such... point. Well, I don't know if it's that Americans are leaving engineering. Like I don't know if I wonder, right? Like I don't know if we have I don't know if it's a declining profession here so much as it's an increasing profession in certain parts of the world, like, I don't know, like you're seeing like India, for instance, is, is got a load of market share now in terms yeah. of like just engineers. really smart people. Yeah. Engineers and scientists. And I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of countries that are just really educating people well. And I mean, we're one of them, you know, the U S is one of them, I should say, but you know, we're not the only one. And so I don't know. It's, it's, I think whenever you're working on something that's, and this is not a direct answer to your question, so I'm sorry for that, but I think whenever you're working for, on something that's, you know, you're trying to push the limits of human achievement or, you know, what's possible given technology, um, you know, you're going to try to find the smartest people from everywhere, like not just, you know, where you're at, you know, like, I don't know. I know I do. I mean, that's that's how I want to recruit. It's like, 
Yeah. yeah and it's, 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 it's frustrating because there's a lot of requ- it's difficult to hire non US engineers because you have to sponsor visas and there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through and I don't know it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass to be honest I mean as you know <laughs> yes yes it's a, it's a, it's it's a lot of effort to, to do it and so it depends of the time and you know this government and that government and whoever the pre- president but yeah it's a, but it's is it easier than it was with the current president than it was with the last one, I wonder? I don't know. I... What's it like trying to like get a job in the U.S., like coming from outside? Is it? Do you find it's a, it's a major obstacle, or is it just more kind of like in, not a big deal? So it's, let's cut the question to two. Yeah. First of all is how, to, how is it to move here? And the second is how to find job. So yeah. how to find job, I I was like trying, but not too hard because I still have consulting uh, yeah, contract. And say, okay, whenever it's going to finish and now I find someone else that wanted to have some other consulting contract and I, it seems to be a good uh, way to balance. Yeah work and, and life here. Um, yeah, contract engineering is great. Consulting is great. Yes, it, it, it's hard. Like sometimes it's not like you can count on them for a long time. You need to work for them. Yeah. But if you have a good uh, field of expertise and yeah. someone and people loves you and knows you. In the Tell their friends about you. Yeah, and it's, it's 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 a it's a good way to to live. It's interesting, but it it's it's a challenge. You need to keep up and always look. And I probably you know that much better than me. And the other question wow, we're was: We're both in similar lines of work. <laughs> yeah, well, you you lived in that. I'm on consulting only for the last year, and you are you did it for a long, long. Time. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I was only full time for a little bit, you know, like, <laughs> so I, I don't really know what that's like as much. But I know it's, but for me to, to move here, um, there is a lot of bureaucracy and uh, you need a state ID and somehow the, a lot of my friends, the same status as me, just they send it to Homeland Security, it's take two months to get a state ID, which... I don't care that only a state ID, but you cannot buy a car ah, without a state ID. You go into T-Mobile or AT&T and you want to buy a phone. So you can b- buy a pre- prepaid phone, but they won't even like, they will, okay, so give me your state ID so I can scan it, so I can give you a service. And say, I don't have a state ID, so I cannot give you a service. Brutal. Um, you want to have your gas or what? Probably you, I, I, I could fight. Gas, you that. don't need a state ID for, though. Um, like, I, so I buy gas with a credit card all the time. But maybe you, do you need a state ID to get a credit card? So, you need, uh, so you need, they need to check your credit history. Ah, fuck. <laughs> so, and if you don't have a social security number, <laughs> no one can know what your credit history is. Oh, it sucks. And you need uh, to have your credit card with the social security number for at least three months in order to get a credit score. That's it's brutal. So like, oh yes, we can uh, send me your passport. I, I was working for days to get some kind of uh, utility. And then I asked my landlord, okay, just like varies on. They didn't, so I told him, can you help me and maybe after 10 minutes, he have a contract. They just, okay, social security number. Okay, it's fair, you're approved. We are coming next Monday. And I, I was working on that for a week, you know, calling them, calling back. And you, you, and you know, I, I have a, I, but everything is yeah. from, others, from other countries. No one, yeah. like, it's not here, it's not exist. That's stupid. <laughs> so it's it took me yeah. almost three months to in order to buy a car. I, I 
I have friends here. They lent me a car. How did you end up getting one in the end? Like, what was the solution to trying to buy a car when? So I, I, I asked for uh, friends that come into Israel. So that was moving to Israel, just left me, left me his car. Um, and this is how I serve it. I have friends that rented car for three months, which is brutal. Expensive. It's very expensive. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't really easy. Um, but, uh, yeah, but now I am after it. Like it's, could I buy yeah. a car and then just give it to you as a gift and then you could give me cash as a gift? I wonder, like, there's got to be some way around that. I don't know. Maybe I'm just overthinking it. It I, sounds like a real pain in the ass, regardless. I, so, so I think you you cannot own a car without uh, state ID. Oh, because you need a driver's license and so why can, can you not have an international driver's license? Oh, no, I guess. Yeah. No, I, I of course I have, but no, you you cannot. You need the state ID, like identification card, in order to have a plate whatever in pennsylvania this is a yeah. law and and it's very hard to bypass it oh, that's I, rough I, and and uh, me so it's and not even the buying and, step so much as the registration step that that gets you yeah and so this is so immigration is is hard like uh, everything every step is very very complicated until you are in the system and then everything is very easy you cannot <laughs> list a car yeah. uh, try to listen you cannot do it without credit history yeah. um but uh, whatever this is this is difficulties of the beginning i yeah. i don't know why but they changed the law a little bit um so i know that in the past it was in within a week you can get a state id yeah i don't know why so many of my friends in in the same situation needed to go through uh, homeland security which takes so much time but whatever it's I, I hope it's they're going to forget it soon. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it back to a week where it should be. Yes, it's it's okay. Yeah. Um, always moving from one place to another. It yeah. takes time. I, I, so my friend that came to Israel, he was complaining about his problem with the <laughs> bank account and I was complaining about mine. It's okay. This is... <laughs> That's okay. So just, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Hey, you need a state ID, you need a uh, ID number. You know? And if yeah. you don't have them, you just... Even moving between states is a little bit of a pain in the ass, but it sounds like not nearly as much of a pain in the ass as moving between countries. Um, yes. Yeah, but but it's, it's, it's a small headache, you know. You, you, are, you bypass the bureaucracy and you go, everyone goes through that route and in the end it's, it's solved and you... And you forget about it, yeah, uh, but I, 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 like just like months and a half ago, I got a car, and it's just and until then you you are <laughs> you're stuck. I'm glad you cracked that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's finally worked for me. Yeah. So, any cool projects that you wanna? I guess you see yourself wanting to get into soon. You mentioned joining like a bunch of maker spaces, so I'm kind of curious, aside from like 3D printing, is there anything you want to build or? So, uh, so if I finally, I think I mastered the SolidWorks. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a nice ability to have, and I, I hope to, to make a few models of a, uh, of mechanical uh, interesting stuff uh, toys uh, you, you remember the, I don't know if you know uh, there was um, a big tradition in the in Russia and like the big Russia um, to have like wooden toys oh interesting I didn't know about this they, so they had like a, a really nice mechanical thing that they made from wood like really simple stuff they had uh, Riddle boxes and uh, other moving things, and I I was wondering, cool. just something that I was always like, this is what I I played with as, as a child, and say okay, like 
let's make it accessible. You can buy it in in Amazon. You know, it's, it's not it's the it's wooden ones. Yes. yes. Uh, Probably made in China at this point. Yeah. Probably. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what What would I search for if I wanted to get that? Russian wooden toys. Nice. It's a uh, from there, you know, like wooden puzzle, wooden. Uh, uh, and that's interesting stuff. Um, and I, I don't, I try to analyze what's the motivation in 3D printing it yourself and not just buy it with five dollars and it's yours. <laughs> uh, but you know, I don't know. This is, this is making stuff yourself and creating it, and you know, this is was always uh, making new stuff is is always fun. I if I if I think about it, a lot of so I my family came from the from history and in academic, and I always you see the traditional Jewish way of learning compared to the academic. Um, so a lot of time you have the motivation on, on making new stuff. You thinking the new. A ideal um, that motivate you even more than like much more than money because in the academy in certain position you you're getting your salary yeah and so what's what's next so yeah. making creating new stuff is the next stuff and uh, the next thing for yourself and yeah I think it's it's a great motivation in, in I agree. Cases. Yeah. Do you think the motivation to make toys comes from having kids? Yeah, Makes of sense. course. <laughs> yeah, um, but to to make something that people really enjoy, it's always. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's great. I I see how much time it keeps me busy. Yeah. Um, and this is only it's it's a hobby. Yeah. Um. It's, there's a fine line, though, I think, between making something for a hobby and making something for work. Because, I mean, either way, if you take pride in it, I mean, not for everyone. Like, I think there's some people that go to work and they hate their lives. And, you know, it's just, it's not really for fulfillment as much as that they just need to make a paycheck. And, you know, then, then you know, they clock out and they're happy and then they're miserable again when they go to work the next day. And I'm glad I don't feel that way. <laughs> but for me, it's... It's not that different than making something as a hobby. I mean, I guess the biggest difference is that I'm lucky enough to get paid when I'm doing it for work, and I am spending a lot of money when I'm doing it for a hobby. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's it's, that's kind of nice. But it's 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 a pleasant to have the uh, jobs that you love and mm-hmm. and enjoy and come there to to play every day. I, I had it for a long time, and it's. Great, and I hope so to find to continue and and find my enjoyment in in work as in a hobby. But it's uh, it's nice to have. So a lot of people don't keep a hobby for themselves, and if you are only in in work, you can find yourself. In a situation when you're retired and you're getting bored, yeah, I, I know a lot of people that just died from. It's okay, I, they don't have any cause in life. Yeah, I felt like my grandfather was that way. Like when he retired from being a doctor, like he just seemed like he was so bored and it just deteriorated fast because that was his whole identity, you know. And so it was like. I mean, he was also 95 years old so when he when he died so he lived a pretty long life but and I think he was 90 when he retired but um, I don't know it was it was sort of a fast deteriorate like he um, he seemed like pretty miserable not to be working and so I guess I have hobbies too like I like to cook I, I really like cooking um, if I don't have the ability to build the sort of thing I want to build at work I'll often come up with a project for myself as a hobby and it, yeah like I said I'll spend a lot of money and time and kind of chase after it but you know it's um, 
it's a similar motivation, which is that I want to contribute in some way to the field or build something I'm proud of or, you know, just have some fun making something. Um, yes, it's a... But, but I, I really admire, like, the, the American culture where there are a lot of people that have hobbies and garage tools and it's much less developed in Israel. In Israel, it's... I see it's it much less, and I, I really admire the the culture that give you a legitimate okay go go play and like. Why do you think that is though that you don't see that as much in Israel? I guess I wonder. That's a good question. I think one is um, that if you see other people do that do it you do it yourself and it's also you don't have Sundays in Israel yeah you have Friday as a vacation day in some places but for religious Jew it's you know Friday is it's only half a day Saturday you cannot do anything yeah and so you don't have any weekend and if, as you said like if taking the thing off your 3D printer bread is considered work by the rules of the Sabbath then you don't have any time to do hobbies because hobbies are considered work. Um, Sounds like. Yeah, so it, what, for Orthodox Jews, I think it's even harder, but I also, I don't I don't know why it's much, but the weekend is, is, is a good reason, the legitimacy of having uh, uh, hobbies that you invest in is another thing and I, I don't know the people here are much more handy and I, I like it I I find a lot of uh, common things it's like people like say you build your house is something that a lot of people can say in Israel no one paints his house like really? there's a contractor that does that does it. that's interesting all the, all the building houses in Israel, you build it from stone because it's the wood is much more expensive. Um, but then you need a lot much more uh, expertise. Um, still, I don't think this is the main reason. That I don't know why, but there's no culture. Because you can learn that too, though. Yeah. I mean, if it, even if it's more difficult, you can still figure it out. Like. Yeah, it's not so hard. Yeah. I don't know why, but there's no culture of do it yourself in the same way that people in the state does. I, I the lack of a weekend makes a lot of sense. Like that, that would seem to me to point to that, you know, because like people, I guess, you know, we've been doing the, uh, the Google 20% time, you know, for like quite a while now as a country, <laughs> you, know? Like, you know, as long as a weekend, I don't know like when weekends became a thing here, but. I wonder, actually. I, I feel like that would be something interesting to Wikipedia at some point. Because it's always something I took for granted because my whole life had existed. But there must have been a time when that didn't exist. I mean, because like you said, it's different everywhere. So. Um, yes, I, I think it's also there is a culture of building your own stuff, uh, maintaining your own farm, um, um, it's it's very strong in the American culture. I don't know how it is in other countries. But don't you have like kibbutzes and stuff? Yeah, I, I was born in a kibbutz. I was yeah. like working with cows. As a... Yeah, so that's maintaining a farm, right? Yeah, I I I don't know by why. I I also feel that it's if you are not handy you handy man you would not teach your kids to be one and I, I i was starting to to work with kids you know yeah. teach them how to hold a um a drill a driller and like and they, they didn't know like even like teenagers and I, my daughter know how to to put new light and uh, change a uh, lock in, in, in the door. Yeah. This is thing that I, 
I taught her, but I don't know why, but in Israel it's... No one knows how to do that. That's interesting. <laughs> That's really interesting. And here everyone knows, which yeah. is great. To maintain your house is um, something that people does here in, in Israel. You know, just calling contractor. Maybe because the contractor, are, a lot of them are coming from the Arab origin. It's it's cheap, but it's not so cheap. So, And here's the, the cost of taking someone American to fix your house. <laughs> they will charge you a lot. Yeah, they're doing all right. Like there's there's a plumber I met recently who drove a Maserati. <laughs> so, it's amazing. Yeah. You can do it. <laughs> And everybody needs a plumber. Like, not that many people know how to do their own plumbing in the U.S. I think. Um, so that's that's one where they can electricians too seem to be doing all right because you know there's not. I mean, not all of them, but you know, there's not that many people that know how to run electrical circuits. And so. And yeah, and and you're always afraid, you know, something will happen, and you get sued, and so yeah. people. Or just you'll hurt yourself, or you'll end up flooding your uh, your house or I had an apartment in grad school where I tried to put in a dishwasher and we um, were trying to get a, a valve closed and it wouldn't close so we took a, a adjustable wrench and turned it and the corrosion was so bad that the valve just cracked and we flooded my whole apartment <laughs> so I was I was a little bit afraid to um, to do any plumbing for a while after that but I, I do my own plumbing now um, most of the time. And um, I remember um, there was a valve that was really corroded I came across recently where I'm like, I am not going to mess with that. You know, like I, I started working on it. Yeah, I was like, but yeah, at a certain point, like you just got to call on someone that knows. Yes. Cool. Well, should we uh, Should we call it? Yeah, let's call it down. Sounds good. Is there anything you want to promote or before uh, we, we end it? No. No, everything is good. If they, I'm, for now, I'm, I'm consulting companies, but if someone in the area or other ways want help in optics, uh, engineering, uh, manufacturing line, I'm... Lasers and terminal ballistics. <laughs> yeah. Also... Awesome. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Bye-bye.